Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for another Monty Hart. Um, this week we have a very good friend and you know, um, someone who I call one of my mentors, Eberhard Gruber, who, as you can see, is really an international uh, interventional cardiologist with expertise in coronary structural. And uh, there are very few people I can say that have had as much an impact on what we do today as Eberhard. And so whenever I can get him to join us, for a few minutes or an hour. I'm always so honored and glad, Eberhard, to have you. And I think the, the whole team also, you know, is really interested to hear about transcatheter mitral valve therapy. Obviously, we've been doing a lot more here in, in, in Montefiore and getting involved in many trials, but it's always good to have, um, you know, a moment to reflect about what we're doing and whether we're heading in the right direction. So thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much, Azim. It's really uh, an honor and a privilege again to have you. When you asked me uh, to talk about mitral valve, obviously this is a very, very, very interesting topic. And you know, who am I talking to? I mean, you are the expert, but I think you know we all are not only friends but also colleagues. And I think it is important that we understand um, how this field is moving. Uh, whether it's moving and in what direction we are moving. And therefore, I'm really grateful that we have a chance to talk a little bit more in length um, about um, mitral valve therapy or transcatheter mitral valve therapy. And not only where we're standing today, but where are we heading to? So um, I would like to continue with my financial disclosure here summarized. And this presentation is at least in part, uh, Azim, uh, meant to be provocative and certainly to some extent idea stimulating. And I, I wanted to mention that at the very beginning because I think it is important. So I, much rather than presenting today as a catalog of valve designs for mitral valve therapies, and before the world spends another one billion on the same concepts um, that did not bring us after all these years a certain gold standard solution to treatment of the mitral valve. I want to challenge us to rethink where we go from here, more of the same or rethinking alternative path to mitral and tricuspid valve therapies. In today's fast changing turbulent world, it is hard to predict the next year, let alone the next years. However, the future of medicine and specifically of structural heart is not something to predict, it is something to build. This very month, or this very year rather, the 20th anniversary of TABA, we can look back with pride and astonishment and implement the experience we built to the existing unmet needs, driving innovative therapeutic solutions forward. So what can we learn from the TABA success to future trends in structured heart, particularly also in mitral valve therapies? Interventional cardiology has been driven by technology and innovations and by better understanding the cardiovascular diseases. It is the individuals with strong conviction, vision, risk-taking and resilience, teaming with technology innovators who have been driving forward new therapies and challenging the IC community with out-of-the-box ideas. Coming to mitral regurgitation, we all understand that this is not a single disease entity. You can see this graph, we don't need to go really into the details, but very, very important uh, that we have two entities particularly uh, important for treatment options, which is functional and degenerative or primary and secondary mitral regurgitation. And on the functional, it's important that not only the left ventricle is in focus, but also the left atrium. Also, mitral regurgitation is a highly prevalent and heterogeneous disease. You can see here in red mitral valve, and then you can see the aortic valve in blue and all valves here. So it is a very, very prevalent disease. And on the right side, you can see its various, its various subsets of anatomic and functional um, um, subsets. So it is a very heterogeneous disease, which obviously makes treatment options a lot more difficult. But we have to say the high risk MR population represents a huge opportunity 
for catheter-based innovations. The presence of severe MR and heart failure is highly prevalent in the elderly. This specific patient population is frequently rejected from surgery, not represented in surgical clinical trials, frequently re-hospitalized with high financial burden. So if we look at our expectations and looking forward, or even in the past, looking forward, it is a very complex disease with many, sometimes even overlapping solutions. I think this is a very nice slide that I owe to Marty. Mitral valve disease is messy, which is to say it is complex, complicated, and by all means, not straightforward, such as aortic valve disease. And here you can see basically the issue that we're dealing with. On the left side in a three-dimensional moving um, image you own of a little animation, you can see the problem that we have in the ring. It is not only the mitral valve, it is the ring, atrium, chordae, papillary muscles, left ventricle. It's moving a three-dimensional space. On the right side, you see opening and closing of the aortic valve basically in one plane. And that explains a lot what the challenges are when we talk about transcatheter solutions. Mitral valve disease is, as we said, heterogeneous collection of multiple anatomic and tactile subpopulations. Continuous iterative device and procedure evolution is needed to optimize device performance and clinical outcomes, which basically uh, is to say we have an unstable technology platform. Control therapies are not well established, constantly changing and operator sensitive. Surgery, only for primary MR. GDMT, for secondary MR, frequent changes, as we all know. And TR depends on anatomic complexity and clinical context. Coet like patients, less than 5% of significant MR populations. Executing clinical trials is challenging, as you know better than everybody else, requiring prolonged enrollment and long-term follow-up in changing environmental conditions, that is, device approvals. And it's gotten more difficult and more complex in Europe in these days. Catheter-based technologies will improve procedural outcomes, particularly in high-risk patients, as I mentioned before. Less invasive mitral valve intervention may be performed with fewer perioperative complications. So we should be striving for that. Progression towards minimally invasive environments, unmet clinical outcomes, quality of health, and healthcare costs are very, very important and could be positively impacted by moving into less invasive interventions. This is basically a summary of the portfolio of transcatheter repair and replacement therapies. We can see here caudal replacement, neocord harpoon, leaflet repair, clip pascal, and then we hear annuloplasty, the two remaining, cardioband and carillon, some others in the early stages, some disappeared, and then the combo uh, procedures. And here on the right side, the replacement, and we'll, we will touch base on all of these in a second. Also, let's not forget there are two types of mitral valve disease, as I mentioned before, primary and secondary, which really are very different, not only from the uh, path to anatomy, but also in the treatment options, primary, degenerative, and secondary, functional, ventricular, and atrial. So we do have uh, solutions here. We can do the replacement, as I mentioned before, or we can do the repair and we come to that. But then also we should open our eyes and be open for innovative solutions. And also I will touch base on that when, as we move forward. Looking at repair and replacement, one of the icons in uh, mitral valve surgery, Steve Bowling, has said good repair is better than replacement, which is better than bad repair. We know that good repair is tough to do. We also know a safe and durable transcatheter replacement is not easy to do and has its issues. So we really need both options from a transcatheter perspective, replacement and repair. So let's start with mitral valve repair. You can see here that there's a changing landscape Many have disappeared, and there are some that are, um, that are still in place. The real milestone has only been achieved by the edge-to-edge -edge techniques 
um, of the mitral clip and Pascal. Looking at primary mitral regurgitation, um, then we can say we look at the transapical and transatrial cordal repair devices, neocord, harpoon, and cordard. Uh, and then more important, as we move forward, the percutaneous transeptal cordal repair devices, and here particularly the neocord nexus, uh, cardiomac, and pipeline um, are in early stages. Uh, so I won't touch base on those. And neocord, I talked to the ones that have done it, and I owe these uh, these summaries to to Azim and, and his team. Um, probably more than three patients have been successfully treated. Uh, early discharge, there was a good reduction of mitral regurgitation, and there was durable and stable anchoring. This is the picture that I owe to uh, to Azim. You can see on the left side uh, the the prolapse, and on the right side, very very good repair. With this, uh, with this transeptal approach, wonderful. Functional mitral regurgitation, a lot more challenging. Transcatheter annuloplasty is relatively com is relatively new compared with its surgical counterpart. But significant progress has been made in recent years. But somehow we're not really moving forward. And here I would like to very briefly bring up Carillon device and the cardio band. Um, we know if we look at Carillon, has very good safety data, reduces mitral regurgitation severely, and we have some signs of positive left ventricular remodeling. Uh, on the right side, cardio band, favorable safety profile, reduces MR sustained out to two years, recently published. And then we have to unfortunately also mention poor technical success, about 73, uh, 78% due to anchor disengagement, and we all know uh, and have heard and seen uh, this happening. So the mitral valve repair issues, transcatheter at least, uh, is rapidly changing. Devices are relatively safe, as I said, but efficacy and user friendliness have to be improved. It's a complex, time-consuming procedure requiring a lot of training. The efficacy is still somewhat in the air and not ideal for early symptomatic patients. The results we have to admit so far have been somewhat disappointed. We certainly have expected more and better results. Real milestones, as I said before, have only been achieved by edge to edge, uh, with has, however, its own limitations. In the near future, the number of tier will certainly increase, but other innovative solutions certainly will emerge. The question I like this picture very much from Michael Mack is co op rising. Um, if, if, if core rising all boats or will the boat only will float only one boat and this is something that we really have to to look into uh, because we always have to think that co apt only represents a certain amount a small amount of the mitral regurgitation population if we look at the challenges of annuloplasty we likely can compare it uh, with a sail in the wind anchoring into a moving target with difficult access and no direct vision, as I shown before on the on the on the little animation, it's like sewing a sail without removing it from the map while the wind is flapping. It is really difficult to do. So, if we look at at the real milestones, the edge to edge therapy, I would like to briefly touch base on Mitral Clip and Pascal. We don't need to talk much about it, but I would like to remind you what the field also grow with imaging. At the very beginning with two-dimensional uh, <clears throat> two echo, we didn't have the high development stages of 3D. It was somewhat difficult to do. The procedure was complicated, complex, lasted long. And as imaging improved, certainly the clip um, the procedure um, uh, improved in both safety and efficacy. And here we can see the generation of clip therapy, both for tier and tricuspid tier. Uh, a lot of progress has been made, and this is a standard therapy. Contemporary outcomes, comparing it to the uh, expand, um, expand primary MR subset on the left side, and you can see on the right side, Everest and um, uh, the, the earlier results, you can see how much on the left side we have improved. Uh, with better imaging, better techniques, and better devices. No question, it's moving forward. Now, the post-clip MR, um, we also discussed, 
uh, future options may be limited because you have a bridge, as you can see here, but we can do it. And this is a case that we did in Cologne, the Elastic Clip and TMVR. You can see here that you can bridge it and cut the bridge with the <coughs> Elastic Clip, as you can see here. Also, and the uh, then and when you clip the and, and remove or at least loosen up the bridge, you can implant a mitral valve, in this case, a tendine valve. Much more to say, the repair MR study is on its way, looking at tier mitral clip device and the surgical mitral valve control. We will see how things are moving forward. So the clip in 2022-23, worldwide the most well-established trans catheter treatment option for mitral regurg, safe, effective, and durable in selected patients with degenerative and functional MR, reduces morbidity and mortality in patients with functional secondary MR. In the US, it has been approved for only high-risk primary MR. There's up to four generations and ongoing the further generations in the pipeline. There are ongoing clinical trials helping to expand these indications. Moving to a very exciting field, transcatheter mitral valve replacement or TMVR. Clinical risk profile and anatomical considerations influence mitral intervention technique selections. Here, so here we have primary and secondary, as we said. Now, a very important um, bar. We have here the risk spectrum: prohibitive, high, intermediate, and low. And then the current available therapy indicated by guidelines: surgical repair and replacement for high to low risk, certainly still today, and the TNVR for prohibitive risk patients. We will see as we move forward here in this presentation, how this could be possibly changed. The development timelines for TNVR are very painful, and we all know that. It has been a long way, and probably still will be a long way forward going. The procedural goals and challenges are very clear. Ease of implantation, the uh, uh, TMVR is agnostic to ideology of MR. There's a reliable elimination of MR if the valve is in, in, implanted successfully and possibly less recurrence of mitral regurgitation. Challenges are clear. The most important ones are shown here, lack of leaflet calcification, dynamic implant, and left ventricular outflow obstruction. In the choice MI trial, you can see here what the biggest issues are of screen failures, small left ventricles, LVOT obstruction, as said before, analyst size, and MEC. So by all means, if we screen these patients, they are not all included. The opposite, depending on who you talk to, screen failure rate still ranges between 60 and 70%. Um, then, obviously, there was a hype. Uh, and I would like to call it the fusion and acquisition frenzy, which was a market expectation. Uh, as you can see here, a lot of money has been spent, but some of it, and a lot of it has been uh, trashed into the, the leash box. Here are the ones um, with, uh, with are still alive and uh, moving forward. Um, the tendine and trapid and tiara valves, which are trans, uh, transapical at the beginning, and then in the lower part, we have the transceptor devices, and I will come to that in a minute. Uh, current TMVR uh, landscape on the, uh, in the red bar, uh, you can see successfully tendine, intrepid, and tiara. The good thing about all these devices, once they are successfully implanted, really mitral regurgitation is eliminated successfully. Uh, we still obviously have issues, but mitral regurgitation is eliminated. However, there's limited applicability of current TMVR designs to the real world anatomy, which is to say it still has a high rejection rate. TMVR designs have limited ability to cover all architectural changes occurring around the annulus and mitral regurgitation patients. Unlike, however, the development of a universal device tool, one design fits all, maybe or actually is challenging. Oh, sorry. 
Uh, as an example, the intrepid valve, the key features of this valve are well known to you, both transapical and transeptal. Transeptal is moving forward. You see here, <clears throat> it is a dual, uh, dual, stent, uh, dual stent design, it has an inner stent and an outer brim. Um, circular inner stent houses a 27 millimeter tri-leaflet bovine pericardial valve. Uh, it, it presently comes in 42, 48 millimeter valves. It is clinically evaluated. Uh, the key features of the intrepid delivery system and deployment are shown here. It is transeptally recoverable until you're happy with its position in the, um, in the mitral annulus. And here you can see how difficult and how painful to some extent it is as we move forward with this particular device, the Apollo, um, the TMVR, the Apollo uh, studies. There was a pilot trial, Apollo 1, Apollo 1 uh, randomized to surgery, single arm, EFS and Apollo 2, 200 plus patients have been treated with five-year follow-up. A very, very important, a very important sequence of trials that we need in order to expand treatment options for regurgitation. Good things are shown here, as I said before, Intrepid Pilot and uh, Apollo Rollins really successfully as shown here, abandoned mitral regurgitation, and that is true for other devices also. If we look at the uh, transceptor devices, uh, it's a field that is also moving forward a lot slower, but, and because transition to transceptor delivery will not be so easy and not, uh, not be so smooth. There are technical challenges, crossing profile, valve fatigue issues by going smaller, navigability and coaxiality challenges, and we all know that. So the transition to transceptor delivery of clinically available TMVR devices will <clears throat> require important engineering modifications in size, possibly valve design even, and anchoring mechanisms. Promising experience with transfemoral, as I said before, intrepid, as seen here, and the early, uh, the early uh, results have been very promising, and EVOC and EVOC EOS, the EVOC EOS uh, is a valve that has been redesigned of the EVOC, fully retrievable, recapturable, 28 French EFS has started with good results. Sapien N3 is also an interesting device, as we all know. It consists of a dock system and of a valve. It's a, it's a, um, it's, it's a, it's a specified, it's a changed valve. Uh, the, the sapien valve, and then here you see the final implant, which is the valve in dock. And here, the leverage is sapien three valve tissue and frame, the knitted pet skirt age and sealing between the native leaflets and the dock, 29 millimeter valve and um, <clears throat> 20, uh, 20 French ethes uh, compatibility. And you can see also on the right lower side, good elimination of uh, regurgitation when the valve is implanted here, you can see the valve in place, the valve in dock. Somewhat similar to that is the High Life Transceptor is also a valve and ring device. Early interesting um, um, results, both in uh, uh, OUS and in the United States um, with good results, at least so far. So we will certainly hear more about this particular valve as we move forward. So what is coming and where we're going, uh, let's, I don't mean to say predict the future, but what are we going to see in the future where we might be heading for? Well, somehow we all have been a little bit frustrated with what we have been doing, what we have been looking at, how the field is moving a lot slower than, um, than TAVR and even tricuspid. The mitral valve is simply a lot more complicated and, and complex. Here again, you can see the development timelines of TAVR on the left side. We moved so smoothly and um, um, consequently forward into the low risk. And here on the, on the right side, the TMVR development really is a lot more time consuming. And this is a very important slide, which you all know, uh, <clears throat> which is basically um, the TMVR comparing it to surgery and to tier because those are the two um, treatment options that are um, recommended by the guidelines. So 
the valve has to be has to be compared and has to be um, ramped up with surgery and with tear. So we have to randomize um, in patients that are suitable for both, randomize to surgery and randomize to tear as shown here, if the patient is suitable for tear. Now, as we said before, if we look at the prohibitive risk, which is here in red, which is both unsuitable for surgery and for tear, then we can do the single arm trial and can move forward with the TMVR with the replacement. But as you can see here, for the time being, that is limited to, these, to the unsuitable patient or prohibitive risk for surgery and TR. Um, so the, the goal of transeptal TMVR obviously is to adapt design to fit multiple anatomic variations, <clears throat> perform in the real world anatomy, uh, looking at large sizes packed into small catheters, which is a, which is a challenge, particularly uh, in the intrepid device, and the evolution of imaging and planning guidance, something that is absolutely important and fundamental uh, in mitral valve therapies. So I will come to the last part, and I, I call it a call from the battlefield, from the battlefield of clinical practice. To further understand all aspects of the mitral valve space, both repair and replacement, we have to get out of the box and out of the zone of comfort to become creative in identifying and implementing new approaches and better solutions to, its, to this unmet clinical challenge for lower risk patients. We know in, in TAVR and in mitral valve, we have followed basically what the surgeons have taught us. Now in mitral, we have a big problem meeting that bar as we all know, but a basic premise of transcatheter valve therapy development, and that's true for all innovation efforts, if you cannot discover new, you cannot discover new oceans unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shores. And I told this slide because it was very, very important when we started with Tabra. Today, no longer, but with mitral valve, I believe this comes back. We have to probably, in order to be successful and maybe to meet the high bar, that surgery is setting uh, by moving forward and maybe lose sight of the shores, which is to say the one, the, the treatment options, the surgery has recommended us. It's not about developing devices. At the end of the day, it is about the patient. And when we develop some, any technology, any new technology, we have to keep in mind what is best for the patient, not to satisfy our ambition and our, and our wish to move the field forward. The patient is the point of care. We should not forget this. So I would like to come to innovation solutions, which are slowly moving forward, Polaris, Sutra, and Half Moon. Um, you have heard probably uh, some of these devices, particularly Half Moon. Uh, <clears throat> there was a redesign and they're going back into clinical trials. Basically what Half Moon does, it is a coaptation augmentation device in, um, in um, the secondary MR. The baffle you can see here is designed to swing anteriorly during systole. Uh, and the clip and the brim work in tandem to provide fixation because obviously, in this three-dimensional system, it is important that the device stays in place, as you can see here uh, in, the early, in the early patient that has been treated with this option. Then other interesting, unique mechanisms and unique devices you can see here, supraannular and atrial anchoring, the altar valve, uh, an interesting, a little bit more futuristic maybe, but there has been patients treated transeptally and transapically, and you can see here um, a, 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 moving, a moving image, uh, interesting new approach, LA placement of this superannular open nitinol frame. And also the InnoFart to turn adaptive technology. And you can see here there's an annular structure 
and the central valve. And here you have the assembled valve. And this is trying to reduce the annulus into a definitive, um, into a definitive uh, size, which fits the central valve. Very interesting coping and moving away from the various sizes of the left atrium. The Vesalius transfemoral repair device, as you can see here, an interesting device that also approaches the posterior leaflet and the interstate replacement device, a new valve with a very specific anchoring mechanism. So we can see a lot of things are underway, a lot of things uh, that are developing in the development, early development stage, but we have to keep our eyes open and to support these approaches in order to move this field forward. So coming to the last slide, the future vision, mitral valve therapy will require probably a toolbox approach and will remain challenging. Surgical repair for primary MR and GDMT is evolving for secondary MR. They are still major contributors. Significant tear growth primary and secondary MR in the future, but additionally, and additional clinical trial evidence is required to expand indications, and the studies are ongoing. TMVR, the TS transeptal axis, should play an important role for multiple anatomic scenarios, including the complex situation of MAC in the future. So multi-device, um, multi-device laser specific approach for initial therapy choice, followed by combination therapy for recurrence of device failure are probably needed in order to be successful in this complex field. With that, Azim, I would again like to thank you for having me early this morning. It's thank always an honor and a pleasure to be here. So thank you very much and please be safe. Everhard, uh, that was really, as usual, a phenomenal talk about the field of uh, mitral and um, is always provocative and making us think about the future and where we're going. Uh, do you have some time for questions and so on from our team and from the fellows and so on? They always they look Absolutely. forward to joining us. So it's very That's, important. I'm, I'm all yours. Okay. So before I pass on to the fellows, I mean, I think, you know, I... I like kind of one of your final messages. Um, and I think it's it's something I say to the fellows all the time is that, you know, we we have to, we've tried very hard to copy surgery uh, in everything we do uh, and particularly for mitral. And I think it's gotten us so far to a certain point. And now if we really want to find solutions for patients, and it's not a question about, and for me, you know, I don't think it's a question about trying to be better than surgery, trying to take patients away from surgery. There's still so many patients I see that are, that are not surgical candidates that I can't help, right? So every week I'm seeing patients in my clinic or in the hospital who I'm consulted about for MR and I can't clip them and they're not a candidate for one of these valve replacements because of the reasons you said. And so I think you know, you're right. We have to start thinking of solutions that are out of the box and you know, it's going to be some of these young guys who are on the call, hopefully will help us figure out some of these solutions. But I think that's where a lot of the area has to go. Um, so I'm going to pass on to the fellows for some questions and discussion. But like I say, I want to keep it in the spirit uh, to the fellows of what we've been discussing. It's kind of looking to the future of where we're going and where the field of mitral is going. So I'm just going to go according to what I see on my screen. Um, Eva, you know, we have a very international team at Monty, including some Germans. So Sebastian <laughs> Ludwig, uh, who works here at Monty with us doing research as well as with, with one Granada. Uh, I'm going to pass it on to him first, Sebastian. Thanks. Thanks, Azim. And uh, thanks a lot, um, Professor Gruber. Amazing talk. Um, great listening to you. Um, I just want to, um, I mean, you, you talked a lot about uh, TMVR and, and the new devices, uh, the devices, the experience that we already have and the devices that are coming up. Um, I just want to know your opinion um, based on your knowledge and your insight. Do you think in the, the future, I mean, the next five or even 10 years, do you think TMVR will become uh, s something like a complementary therapy um, for only for patients that are not tier candidates? At high surgical risk, or do you think there's, um, you know, the potential that TMVR might become, you know, a competitive therapy that um, you can treat patients 
with tier eligible uh, anatomy or even surgical like uh, patients? Yeah, so thank you very much. You know, th this is very important. And what, what Azim said very briefly, I really have to thank him because um, Azim has been a, a pioneer in, in, in the mitral field. And it was very difficult, even sometimes painful to admit that we have to kind of step back a little bit. We were very optimistic at the beginning uh, about what we do, how we do it, how we move forward. Even though we always said, well, mitral valve is not aortic valve. In the back of our head, we still thought it is basically something that we could duplicate. And we clearly have to admit this is not the case. Having said that, your question is obviously very relevant. And I want to I want to try to avoid the image that an old man that I am now uh, doesn't know what to do anymore. So he's looking at it in a very pessimistic way or more realistic way. That is absolutely not the case. Uh, I'm still in it. I'm still following it. And I believe, and that's something that I would like to, to point out. And that's why I said the patient's the point of care. If we find solutions that help patients in whatever risk uh, spectrum they are, then we're doing well. But if we do something and we know there are better options uh, with surgery, then it is very, very difficult to convince patients or even convince ourselves to do that. The bar is very high. Let's be honest. The bar is very high, both in replacement and in repair. Um, and as you said, or as we know, the repair, if we compare 100% mitral valve surgically, only 30% is replacement. 70% of the patient population is repair. So when we focus now on, re on replacement, that is unfortunately because, or probably in my view, because we haven't been very successful apart from the clip. And we can discuss the clip up and down and right and left. Um, but I, I think replacement is not the answer to it. Um, replacement is still an artificial heart valve. Here we, at least we can see the field is moving forward, but I don't think that replacement is the answer. If we have better options repairing the mitral valve surgically, it is a limited space to the prohibitive risk patients, and that's not... It, it is a, a certain percentage, but it is not a large percentage. So as much as I like the development, the money that's being put into development of, of valves, I think we have to concentrate on repair uh, with new solutions and leave the repair for those that cannot be, uh, I'm sorry, leave replacement for those that cannot be repaired. Absolutely. Well, we, um, we cannot change our, we cannot change simply because we cannot, we're not so successful. We cannot change the focus. The right. focus is still trying to repair the valve. Manas? Thank you, Dr. Gruber. It was an excellent talk. Um, just wondering what your thoughts are on kind of the, the, the future of TMVR as a generalizable therapy for the interventional cardiology community? Is this something that's gonna be limited to a few centers where they have experience and uh, um, volume, or is this something that can be generalizable? I think we have some experience with CLIP, but uh, what about TMVR? What about other repair technologies? Just curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, very good question. You know, and, and basically that's the same, we have to answer with, with Taver. Um, the the more developed the field is is uh, the more developed the field will be, the more physicians will be doing it, and the more experience we have. You see this in the clip population. Unfortunately, um, which I call the blessing and the curse of the clip, it's, it's such a safe procedure that everyone can do it, but or almost everyone, I should say. But then you know, you have these results that are not always optimal. And the more centers you have and the less experience with the expansion of the field, uh, you know, the, the results are getting worse. It's, it, it is what it is. And I think for the time being, certainly for 
uh, for our stage in TMBR, it is not something that is um, um, ready for prime time in order to expand into centers that have less experience. You know, look at not only uh, the intervention cardiologist has to be there. It has to be a team that uh, not many, it's expensive, first of all, uh, and the team effort of imaging, physiology, heart failure specialists, surgical, you know, all this has to be combined when we look at this. I'm not sure whether uh, a lot of centers um, um, have that infrastructure. And I think right now, in order to really form the base for expansion, we have to do it well in experience centers. So I think for the time being, this will be reserved to special centers, uh, at least in the in the foreseeable future. Mm. I've also, I mean, I have to say, um, Abra, I mean, me and you have been doing this for a while, and no matter how many H to H repair procedures I do, I still feel like I'm learning with every single one, and there are things that happen that sometimes I can't predict. It's just it's not predictable and reproducible. And to me, that's the, when I see that in, in sort of my hands, I go, but then what about the centers who are doing 20 a year, right? How do those centers ever get great reproducible outcomes? Now, I'm sure, you know, industry helps because they send, you know, clinical specialists there all the time, but you're right to, you know, to really do good procedures, you really need to have a good team. And I noticed, you know, even here in New York, you know, our procedures got better because the whole team got better, right? Because the imaging got better, the, you know, I got better, but still we, it's sometimes hard to predict. We don't always have the results we want to have or we think we're going to have. And then because it's the only device we really have that's easily available, we also sometimes use it in the wrong patients because we have nothing else, right? So it's a real challenge. Um, so I'm going to keep moving along the list here. The fellows uh, all got their hands up to ask you a question. Uh, Pierre Pasquale. Yep. Um, thank you very much. Uh, great presentation. Um, I, I was wondering, you talked about elastic flip. And I really like the, you know, going back to surgery and looking at how a good re uh, repair is better than a replacement, which is better than a bad repair, right? <laughs> uh, so <laughs> that's, that's the issue, right? So when, when we're doing transcatheter repair, most often, once we go for repair, uh, we are committed to it. So if it go, doesn't go as, as planned, most of the times you end up, um, you know, to refer a patient to surgery if it's really going bad. And you're talking about elastoclip. I think that's a very interesting uh, procedure. I was just wondering if you had any insight on the reproducibility of this uh, procedure. And also thinking about eventually doing a TMVR on that after elastoclip. My understanding is that you're cutting the leaf, the anterior leaflet, uh, right? So paradoxically, you might increase eligibility of patients for TMBR because you're actually cutting the leaflet. And then second question, it's uh, just uh, really out of my mind. Uh, we were talking about it for valve implant procedures in aortic. Uh, what do you think about aversion of the leaflets in the mitral whenever implanting on TMBR so that you don't have an obstruction in the LBOT? So uh, elastic clip, uh, I mean, you know, it is something, uh, it is not a very elegant solution, let's be honest. I mean, it is something that we can do in order to avoid a real, a real, you know, a, a real transfer to surgery. And when the patient has high risk, then we don't like to send them to surgery. So we did, I think altogether four or five and what you do is you, 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 you cut it and then, you know, this thing bounces back and forth and, and then you put the, the, the tendon, at least in Germany, you put the tendine in and you kind of, you know, push the, uh, the, the clip against the side. Imagine, you know, um, for many patients, if you have two, three or even four clips, and then you push them to the side, it's not very elegant. It might actually be prone to thrombosis or some other issues. I don't think it's a good, it is a solution, uh, but it's not a very elegant solution. And we have to do better than that um, in, order to, um, in order to really give an option to post clip patients that have a recurrency. And unfortunately, and I, 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 maybe I, I was misreading Azim's words or reading something into it that I would be thinking about it. 
if we, you know, this is just our mindset in an events cardiology. We are, we are, we like to be positive. We are positive, and we like to focus on good things much rather than bad things. And we have to admit, as we all said, you know, the clip is a good procedure. But then, if you do the clip in centers that are not so not so experienced, we these patients will be coming back sooner or later. Maybe not today. Maybe not tomorrow. But eventually, they will be coming back. And we know this, um, and I had, I don't know whether, whether Azim in his time in, in Italy, I had long discussions with Alfieri and even long discussions with Bowling, uh, you know, about, about this, uh, this, this thing. And, and uh, let's not forget one of the fundamentals of the, of, of the clip uh, is avoided, uh, which is to stabilize the ring. I mean, stabilize the annulus with a ring. We don't do that, at least not in the primary. So the combo device, yes, you do it, but then uh, one fundamentally important step in, in Alfieri's approach, at least according to what he said, is stabilize the analyst, which gives you a certain dimension of the analyst. Here, we just reduce the orifice and the analyst can still expand. So uh, it is not quite the, the approach that he recommended or he did at, at that time. Having said that, um, uh, again, elastoclip, I don't think it's a good solution. It is something that we can do in a high risk or a patient that we don't like to refer to, per, to surgery, um, but we end up with a, with a replacement. So um, that's one question. The second question was, again, what the anterior leaflet? What no, so, I mean, you know, one of the things we were wondering about, you know, uh, we're talking about um, is whether when you deliver the valve, you know, because the big issue is the anterior mitral valve leaflet for alveolar flow tract obstruction. I mean, obviously not just that, it's also the septum, but you, I mean, oh, sp do, sp do any of these technologies like evert it, like pull it upwards so it goes away from the alveolar T? Do you know if any of these technologies are looking at that? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's obviously, that is an interesting approach <laughs> away from slicing it, yeah. which is still, which is still fairly complex and complicated. I think it's interesting. I think that's something that at least would avoid, um, you know, would increase the number of patients that could be treated because <laughs> a new obstruction uh, yeah. is really something that that is painful in the screening process. And if we have something that eliminates the anterior leaflet by putting it upwards or by slicing it, uh, I, I think that's that's interesting. And interesting, you know, Edwards or other uh, strategics, they are very deeply looking into these technologies in order to get more patients um, suited for their devices. Right yeah. now, yeah. it's simply limiting. So it's an interesting approach. Yeah, absolutely. We'll see. You know, but, you know, one of the challenges, you know, you saw from Sebastian's date, uh, the choice am I that, you know, maybe two thirds of patients are turned down in real life. I got to say, it's actually a lot more, you know, we to get one patient into a clinical study of TMVR, we have to send eight patients. So for every eight patients, we send them that we've already pre-screened a little bit, we get one accepted, which is, it's very difficult to have a technology be successful if the criteria are so stringent. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Andre, I'm going to go to Andrea, then Gali, Jonathan, and Sebastian. We, I don't want to keep um, Dr. Gruber too long, so short questions, team. Okay. Andrea. Hi. First of all, thank you for this talk as always i have just a quick question as you say um, repair uh, had great improvements in the last year thanks also to improvement in imaging modalities but still as professor latip said we we have so many patients that we cannot treat with a repair solution so we need replacement and most of them are uh, rejected so how do you envision the future of the mvr do we need uh, more valve sizes a different design which is the best approach for you to move this field forward? Um, I cannot <laughs> answer questions. Um, we, are, we are talking about a certain percentage of, uh, of uh, mitral regurgitation patients, the ones that we cannot uh, non-invasively uh, treat annuloplasty. Uh, so so <clears throat> do we need more valves? 
Um, I, you know, that's it is a good question because the valves that we have right now, and obviously that's my personal opinion. Um, you know, tendine valve is an interesting valve. It's a successful valve. Uh, it, it is being used in Europe, it's approved in Europe and, and uh, in the United States is being, being uh, implanted. I don't think it is a valve of the future. Mm -hmm. I think this valve um, uh, at some point will go out. Um, also, I believe that transeptal is the way to go, regardless of what others are saying or thinking. I think uh, transeptal is the way to go, at least for interventional cardiology. That limits, for example, or you can see the struggle with Intrepid. Um, it is a, a valve that initially, and I was there from the very, very, very beginning, and that was one of my concerns in the discussion with Andy Cleland, who was the then CEO of this company, <clears throat> 12. I said, you know, the, the fundamental problem was that, you know, he believed that that transeptal is not the way to go, it's transapical. So the design is very interesting, compensating for the movement of the annulus and leave the inner valve alone. So that is an interesting approach, but it is still two brims, two, two layers of metal, and therefore, you know, downsizing it, see how long it took Metronic to do that and how many uh, engineers were doing it, and they're still up to, uh, let's say they're, they're striving for 29 French, <clears throat> which is still pretty big. So for all these things, do we have valves that are better? Yes, we should have valves that are better. High life uh, is interesting because it has a low footprint and has only one, um, one stand, if, if, if I may say, but it has different issues. So uh, I believe, yes, we do need better valves. We knew new generation valves. And particularly if you look on the Chinese market, um, there are some very, very interesting valves coming up. Uh, we'll see how that will go. But I think the present valve generation can always be improved. Also, if we look at M3, um, uh, interesting approach, no question about it. I'm always concerned if you restrict the motion of the cordae by whatever device you're using, either a circular device or you are con constraining them or, or catching them, if they rupture, that is very difficult, and not only approval-wise, but also maybe um, for, for the, for the long-term results. So I think, you know, we do, have int we do have good designs. We move forward with the restrictions that Azim himself said, screening failure is still high or um, failure rate still high. So therefore, if we have valves with lower footprints, uh, not addressing the usual issues, I think we will move the field forward. However, even if we have better valves, our focus should also be get somehow into a repair um, section, which is the majority of, of patients that we have to treat. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, me and you, um... Everhard, we worked a lot on, on annuloplasty. I mean, we did cardioban, we did melipede, mitraline. I still, I still agree with you, though. I think, you know, there's still something that for me is missing in our toolbox to have a good annuloplasty device that's easy to implant and, and can be done in a suitable amount of time without complications. Because, I mean, when we were doing cardiban and, and, and millipede, I mean, some of these patients had an incredible reduction in MR, right? And I think, you know, combo therapies, uh, if we really want to repair to have long-term durable outcomes, part of that has to be stabilized in the annulus. I, I couldn't agree more, Azim, and I'm really grateful that it comes from you and not yeah. from the old man. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> You're younger than me uh, at heart. <laughs> um, Gali, I see your hands up, Gali. Yes, um, good morning. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Grubb, um, for, for the presentation. Um, very, very um, insightful. Um, I, I have two questions. Um, I understand. Just one, just one, Gary, because we need one. to end. Just one question. Gonna, just one question. I'm going to combine both of them. So, <laughs> um, combine it, yeah. <laughs> so, once 
I understand the the, the issue with the uh, the mitral valve is it's so heterogeneous. You have saddle shape, you know, annulus issues like that. If you have MAC, um, you know, and you have severe MR, do you think this um valve, like you mentioned, the entropy, the ever from Edwards S3 of label or N3, do you think if you have some mark in the mitral valve that increases the chance of having a better outcome with that? And do you foresee that these valves, this TMVR um, valve, are going to be randomized to mitral trip and leaflet thrombosis? Any insight on this? Well, the MAC population, as you know, um, you know, they, they, they're in the big trials, they are, they, they are, they are um, registries, they're MAC registries in, in all of them. And um, as far as I'm concerned, you know, the, the present valves, both in Trepid and Tendine, have been so far, we, we will see the end result, obviously, but they have been quite successful in, in, in treating MAC. The, the MAC population is a very, it's a, it's a very difficult uh, subset of patients, obviously. Calcium, wherever it is in our body, uh, we don't like it, and um, particularly not in a moving target <clears throat> because that restricts our, our treatment options. But I think uh, we, we can say that both with Intrepid and with Tendine, the, the TMVR, I mean, the MAC results of, of, these, of these valves have been, have been very good. So it can be done. Uh, it is being done, and we will see when we have more patients in these registries uh, to see whether this is a doable approach. It is certainly, uh, you know, particularly in unclippable patients with MAC, for example, <clears throat> or with various calcifications, that is certainly a very, very good option uh, if they can't be done with surgery. And even surgery, let's be honest, in MAC patients, uh, it depends That's very, really very much on the experience of, of surgeons. Uh, how to deal with that. And I had the privilege to work with Vince Gaudiani and he had an excellent insight. So Mac and certain uh, insurgents also, they're not good friends. Yeah. So that last couple of questions, uh, we finish with the Germans. Uh, Jonathan? Yeah, thanks for my side as well for the great talk. Uh, I'm wondering a bit, um, one perspective is, are we having the right device? But another perspective might be, are we having uh, the right patient? So especially in SMR, um, it is more and more considered in this complex like heart failure setting with a continuous disease course where you might also reach a point where it's too late for treatment. So some might argue that you should rather consider these therapies like add an, as an additional heart failure therapy that should also come in earlier, more in parallel with other uh, therapies. What do you think about such like considerations? And if doing so, how to justify this if we only have data in uh, high risk and uh, severe symptomatic MR patients? A great, great question. Great question. A real great question. Yeah. <clears throat> and very, very important. That's why I mentioned the heart failure, the heart failure group that has to join. And that is one thing, <clears throat> and I remember, um, some years ago when the heart failure guys opened my eyes a little bit, they said exactly what you said. We are, we are, we are tackling those patients too late, particularly in, in functional MR, not particularly, but in, in functional MR, we're tackling those patients too late. Uh, the question then is, we all know we would love and we actually might need to treat these patients early before they get into the stage of, 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 uh, of no return, if I may say, if you know what I mean. Um, and that would be wonderful. And then we would have devices, better devices, that are successful in early stages, as we know that, and Carillon is an example for that. <clears throat> Carillon is much more, much better in, in uh, you know, stage two uh, patients than in stage three and four, as with other devices. The problem here is, as, as you mentioned, how do we justify that and how could that be done? I think to some extent, Ankara is going this, uh, this direction to see whether we can, and that's a step-by-step -step approach. So once we know this device is successful in three and four, then maybe <clears throat> we have reasons to believe once it is safe and it's effective, then we have reasons to believe we can move it up to two or even one um, before the patient gets heavily symptomatic. Very, very important question. And I think this is 
should be one of the focus points uh, in, in, in future treatment options. Very, yeah. very good question. Great question. Um, Sebastian, we're going to go to you for the, for the last uh, live question. There was a question from Samina, which I will take. And Samina asked, um, in patients who have MR increased gradient, uh, what therapy will become standard of care? So I think, Samina, you know, there are a couple of parts to this. If the increased gradient is just from flow and from severe MR, then treating the MR with, with whatever technique, even edge to edge, will be the therapy, I think. But if in most cases that I think you're talking about are patients who have increased gradient either from their annulus being too small or from the leaflets not opening. And so there it's an issue of the orifice not being large enough. And the only thing that's really going to help that patient is having a larger orifice. So valve replacement is going to help, whether that's surgically or transcatheter. Um, Sebastian, <coughs> we'll give you the last question. Yes, um, I'm going to be very, uh, very quick. Um, just one brief question. Uh, I mean, Azim already uh, already said it. There are many patients you, that you see in your, your I mean, your daily practice that you cannot treat with any uh, therapy whatsoever. No surgery. No, no tier candidate, no, not eligible for, for TMBR trials. Um, can you come up with a definition of these patients? Uh, so what are the, you know, one, two, three key characteristics? And um, both of you, maybe, do you see any device in the pipeline or being investigated that targets these patients, really? I mean, the, these, the, this treatment gap, or do you think there has to be, you know, more innovation, more devices uh, um, to, to treat these patients? Yeah. Azim, why don't you take that? Yeah, that's a good question, <clears throat> Sebastian. So, you know, I think we all answer this from our own practice. And so my practice here in the Bronx, every single week I'm saying no to a patient for mitral that I can't do anything because every single week, okay? Um, I almost never say any more no to a patient for Tava because we can find some way of treating them. Even if there's no access, we can still get to the heart some way. And even now for tricuspid, I have to say, it's hard for me to say no, because between edge to edge valve replacement, and now we can offer, you know, heterotopic valves, valves in the cava, even for those with severe RV dysfunction, I can do something, in, maybe in a clinical set, but I can do something to make them feel better. Okay. And, but mitral is just so complex, I can't. So the patients I'm saying no to every week, they're all the same. They're patients who have calcium on their leaflets. Okay, or on the subvalvular apparatus and calcium on the annulus, right? So they have a degree of MR with mitral stenosis. And by definition, these patients, because they also have mitral stenosis, their ventricles are small. So I can't clip them because I'm going to give them mitral stenosis or the clip is going to damage their leaflets. And I can't put a valve into them because either the annulus is so small, okay, or because I'm going to close off their LVOT. So that for me is a huge group of patients where the surgeons don't want to operate because for the similar reasons, they're not going to get good outcomes. And these patients are, you know, have renal disease, they have multiple comorbidities. I don't know what the right thing is there. I honestly don't know. I mean, will we in the future, do we need to think of uh, being you know, really out of the box? Will we maybe have a calcification modification therapy where we can put something across the valve that modifies the calcium. So maybe the leaflets start moving more, okay? Will we be able to completely remove the leaflets? I don't know, but right now, I don't see a technology for these patients, uh, which just you know shows you how much innovation is still required in the mitral field and how early on we are still. I mean, you know, um, Everhard was saying this year is 20 years since the first Tava, okay? Next year is 20 years from the first mitral clip. Yes. Okay. I mean, let's not forget that. I mean, right now we're 20 years from the first TAV and look what we can do, how many patients we can treat. TAV now is the predominant therapy around the world for aortic stenosis, more than surgery. 20 years next year after the first mitral clip and we still don't know what we're doing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> and, I think, <laughs> and I think that's really the reality of it. <laughs> yeah. It's thank true. Ebad, final comment before we say goodbye to you. And again, thank you so much, Ebad. This was so thought-provoking and so much fun. Oh, it's more fun to have these discussions. 
where you are not time con you, you, you we have time constraints but you know to go a little bit more into details of what we're trying to say and i think the most important thing is that we stay honest to ourselves we are innovators and certainly you know azim is one of the the leading ones uh, open minded but we should not forget the patient and and he is uh, that's why I admire him so much. He, you know, he takes care of the patient because that's our 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 point of focus, or our focus. And I think uh, as we move forward, um, we we should not leave it out in mind. I'm optimistic that with new approaches, see new approaches that never been done before. As an example, half moon. Uh, granted, you know the the first one wasn't wasn't uh, you know was a design issue or anchoring issue, but. I'm sure it will come back. And then we have something completely di different, which might actually give other options uh, for, for uh, our treatment options. And I think that opens the door. And this is the way we should be moving forward and not think, how can we improve the clip and how can we uh, you know, improve valves? That is, a, that is something that will go anyway, but I mm -hmm. think we have to be out of the box uh, and think of solutions, as you said, be it scoring um, devices or something that modifies calcium or something that modifies coaptation surfaces and things like that. So the field is uh, challenging um, and by all means not pessimistic, but if we compare it, uh, it's probably one of the most difficult ones. It's, it's much more than tricuspid and it's certainly much more than, than TAVR. And uh, with that, uh, Azim, great group, phenomenal uh, questions always a pleasure and an honor to be with you and hopefully i see you in person london valve uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks okay looking okay. forward to it absolutely okay thanks everyone take care guys okay, take care take bye bye, care. bye, -bye.